Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 818. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 21st, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. George and I are glad you could join us. This is our happy place. This is where we sit down and talk about the news around the world, most of it Anglican, some of it Christian, and some of it politics, because that's fun. Politics are fun, George, unless you're talking with your kids about politics. Then it's not really fun. Or your your parents, then, then it's not really fun. But politics can be fun. Uh, George, how are you doing this week? I'm very busy. It's an exciting time here. My wife, Susan's up in Philadelphia. She's uh, helping my mother-in-law declutter her assisted living apartment. When she moved from her house to assisted living, she basically kept, took everything with her. So her, her little room looks like King Tut's tomb, where you have <laughs> all the things she'll need for the afterlife. Uh, mm-hmm. Every little Oh, here's my souvenir from the World's Fair of 1939 when my father took me when I was five. Susan is basically going to be helping her make it a safe, not a trip hazard place and mm-hmm. not something that will catch on fire. Uh, I've been really busy down here uh, putting the finishing touches. We're going to have Nigel Mumford. He has a ministry by his wounds ministry based out of Virginia Beach. Nigel's really, I think, well known in the Anglican world, Episcopal world. We're going to have a weekend in February that we're going to focus on post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans. We have a large veterans community here, and I have two younger men, mostly Vietnam vets, uh, the World War II generation is almost all gone, but uh, we have a lot of retirees or Vietnam vets, and I've got two men who served in Iraq who suffer from severe PTSD. So this is, uh, it's gonna be a community event not just a parish event. So I'm really looking forward to this exciting weekend in February for us. All right. We are in Madison this month, and uh, I, too, am helping my mother declutter in a way. I'm actually helping her with the IT stuff. She has hired two people who are declutterers. They they advertise on Facebook, and they come, and they do what that Asian woman does uh, on Netflix, where they they take everything and uh, make your mansion into a shoebox. And they've done really well. They've emptied most of mom's uh, uh, stuff out of the storage, and I can walk from room to room in mom's uh, new place now. And so mom has made a successful transition to uh, assisted retirement living. So there's, that's a lot off my mind. <laughs> so uh, it, it's fun. Now, it, it's kind of funny here. We're, we're in Madison, which is in Wisconsin, which is a, a northern state. The next state over is Canada in the country. So uh, the news people here on the Weather Channel are going absolutely bazonkers because it's 92 today. I guess that's like 93 or 94 Celsius. And so there's a, this is the worst climate change ever. And I, I grew up here. 92 is normal. <laughs> oh, my. Stop blowing it out of proportion. Hey, talk about blowing things out of proportion. We can talk about the news a little bit today, George. Uh, Bishop of Hawaii gives an update on the Maui wired wildfires. And uh, clearly the Episcopal Church lost a church over there. But we referred last week to the hundreds and hundreds of uh, missing and most likely dead children in the fire. Let's give a quick update on that. Bishop Robert Fitzpatrick, uh, Bishop of Hawaii, he's based in Honolulu, has been to the island. Uh, he went the day after the fire and he held a joint uh, ecumenical service with Larry Silva, the Catholic Bishop of Hawaii. And the situation is bad. The in that there are five Episcopal churches on on uh, Maui, and I think there's one ACNA congregation. Mm-hmm. The one in Lahaina all, was the Episcopal one in Lahaina, Holy Innocence. It was an old 100-plus-year church, 125-year-old church uh, that had a church preschool. Uh, it's parish hall, it's vicarage, the church itself, everything was burnt to the ground. The only thing that remains is the little sign, wooden sign on the corner of the street. Next to the church, 
is the, was the King Kamehameha the Third public elementary school. So you've got the public elementary school and the preschool side by side. Dur on the day the fires broke out, there was very high t hurricane winds and the children were sent home early. Now, that meant probably for the preschool, the parents came and got them. But for the elementary school, many of those children just walk home. If you're eight, if you're a 10 year old boy, you live in a small town, you'll walk home. You don't need a bus and all this and that. At this stage, the there are 850 identified missing people, and there could be up to four or 500 more tourists, transients, people working on the island that day. The governor of Hawaii and the mayor of Maui County have declined to answer how many of those people are children, even though they know 850 identified people who cannot be found after a week. Now, Maui, you can walk across from one end to the other in about a day or two. Uh, and after a week, if you've not, if you've not been found, you're dead. So what the Bishop of Honol of Hawaii was essentially saying is that uh, we're going to have a, a massive, massive death toll of children who were either on their way homes when the fires raged through the town or home alone when the fires were raged, raging through or something. So we, we can now, I can't even guess. I don't know how many children we're talking about, but 9-11 was a tragedy. I would, Kevin, you and I remember remember well, it well. Well, yeah, 9-11 is a tragedy. I, I think of like the tsunami in uh, Thailand in 2004, mm -hmm. where we lost 225,000 people. Uh, that's, you know, that is unimaginable. Here, this is an attack. This is a natural disaster where fire has basically incinerated uh, a portion of the island. And those kids who were on their way home or at home were incinerated as well. It's going to take a long time to identify their remains. And there's parents right now in absolute turmoil because they don't know where Johnny is or where little Sally is. Um, and it's going to take a long time to um, identify them, if at all. The, uh, the news of uh, government incompetence is coming out and all these, you know, the D Hawaii Electric uh, put all their money into green energy projects rather than uh, repairing what they knew to be outdated and dangerous overhead wires. One of the reasons why it took so it was all hard to get out. You see these pictures of all these cars burned down on the highways. There's only one road out of town and Hawaii Electric had their trucks repairing poles. And so the traffic was basically narrowed trying to get around the trucks. And it at a certain point, the fire overtook the rear of the column and everybody fled on foot. Some people dove into the ocean and uh, sadly, those were the first bodies that were recovered because they suffocated. They weren't burned to death, they were suffocated by the oxygen being burned up by this intense firestorm. Um, this past Sunday, we have adult education classes where we, uh, our themes is where we look at uh, topical news items through the lens of scripture. And I was asked a uh, number of times this week in uh, small group meetings we have, George, are we seeing the end times? Uh, we've got war in the Ukraine, we've got famine, we've got, you know, corruption. It just seems like everything and the church is, is a, the church has become false. Its leaders are, uh, are, are, are have abandoned the pure word, word of God to give us words that tickle our ears. And I, you know, my answer is nobody knows, but uh, gosh, it is a tough time. But now to have this tragedy, uh, I think it's going to hit emotionally when we finally get the numbers and the pictures and things. Yeah, when you talked about 9-11, 9-11 was emotional because every day people are putting up more and more uh, pictures on fences around uh, the destructive uh, World Trade Center. I, mm -hmm. you know, missing since 9-11, uh, my husband Rob, he was on the 40th floor of the tower, you know, and that was making more and more a connection as people uh, were seeing these pictures of all the missing people. 
which was about 3,000 at the time. Uh, and this will make the same type of connection where uh, our heartstrings will be pulled as it should be uh, at such a, a loss of life and especially young innocent life. And we'll be pointing fingers for years. We, we do it all the time when we have a tragedy like this. But in reality, how can God be glorified at the end of the day? How, do, how, how does God get glorified in that? And that's where we as Christians have to come forward and um, pass the clinics and say, we don't have all the answers, but we're here to mourn with you and grieve with you and walk through this with you. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a time to, to, you know, deny the grief that's going to occur from this. Uh, you know, and we've had natural disasters throughout all time. Earthquakes, tsunamis, fires. Um, it's, it's part of the, the course of this, this created earth and this created universe. You know? Well, this is looking to be basically become the worst, second worst fire in the U.S. history in terms of death. But mm -hmm. Evidently, in 1871, there was a Wisconsin forest fire that burned down a few dozen towns and 1700 people were killed and this is going to be it's going to be close if sure. it doesn't pass them I, a long time ago there was a uh, i think it was in texas a school exploded uh because of a natural gas leak under the school uh i don't remember all the details but you know hundreds of kids were killed and you know these are just the tragedies we, we need to learn to avoid um but surprise surprise uh you can't always avoid uh, natural disasters. All right, let's see what else we got on our list here. Um, we took flack, as sometimes we do, for talking about topics we know nothing about. <laughs> How dare you? Uh, and I, I grew up in Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin, and I grew up uh, next to the uh, Chippewa Reservation. Uh, I had friends who were Cherokee, um, and I have uh, a rapport and friends who uh, were native and indigenous to this country before it was a country to North America. And I don't uh, feel I'm insulting anybody by talking about things important to their culture. Do I know it all? No, of course not. Uh, do I see the pain and suffering that they as a uh, people went through when settlers came to this country? Absolutely. Uh, do I think it's a open wound in our country? No, I think it's a scar that we can learn to avoid again. Uh, you and I have talking about uh, indigenous children who were uh, some taken, some moved away from their families in early America and sent to religious schools, Roman Catholic and other. And there has been a cry out there the last couple of years that most of these children were murdered. And we know that because we found through ultrasonic wave testing their graves. And I early on said, this is horrible if it happened. We don't know it happened until we see DNA evidence, which we can get nowadays, or bodies or stuff like that. Just, air, just sonic samples at the surface does not reveal anything. And oh, did I get in trouble. Oh, the people, Kevin, you're talking about something you do not know. Here's what I do know. I do know the Roman Catholic Church and other church schools were there to deculturize the savages. You know, they were there to take the Indian out of the kid and make the kid a young Western uh, child and, and grow up in, in the, the burgeoning America. I, I know that. But I said, please, just give me a body. I at heart, God made me a scientist. He made me the doubting Thomas who has to touch the, the, oh, the, the wounds of Christ. That's, that's who God made Kevin. And please don't be offended if I ask, hey, give me a body. George, we have an update to this story that we got so much trouble for. Two-part update. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, the Anglican Church of Canada, uh, the, it's not called the United Church, but it used to be the Presbyterians, all have made apologies for their residential school systems. The apologies began on the point that you made of basically robbing some of the children of their cultural identity and heritage, turning them to little Englishmen or Canadians right. or whatnot. You and, I, you and I agree that that happened. 
Yeah. That morphed over the last 10, 20 years into from cultural genocide with quotes around it to real genocide that the schools were basically Dickensian horrors, murdering children left and right, run by perverts and all this, that. And of course there were few bad actors and this and that. But it just just became so overblown about the genocide of these children. And of course, unscrupulous politicians like uh, Trudeau, uh, there's a picture of him on his knees at the Pine Creek Reservation on the side of a former school holding a teddy bear, trying to make amends, praying over the graves of what were supposed to be Indian children. Well, uh, the former Catholic Bishop of Calgary, Fred Henry, who is on his deathbed, wrote a letter to one of the Catholic newspapers basically saying, enough, enough, show me a body. Uh, we're to we have conflated two things here. We've conflated uh, cultural imperialism with, cultural with uh, uh, murder, with abuse. And the residential schools did a really good job in most cases of providing, because so many of these children coming from the reservations came from dysfunctional homes, alcoholic homes, broken homes. <coughs> and this was the church's response at the request of the government to help these people, not some nefarious scheme to harm them. Now, of course, Bishop Henry uh, was immediately beaten up by the other the senior Catholic leaders, oh no, we must be contrite about this. Well, this past weekend, the Ca government of Canada dug up the uh, site of the on the Pine Creek res Residential School in Manitoba. And this was one of the epicenters where ground radar, I don't know, it's when so, this, this radar that can sort of find things under low, ground well, sensing yeah, radar. Yep. Yeah. Uh, where the advocates were saying, we've found 57 graves uh, at this site. Well, the government came in, dug everything up with the Indian, local Indian uh, or First Nation leaders there. Nothing. Nothing at all. No bodies. So Bishop Henry's point about show me a body. And we had, if you will, the Canadian Auschwitz excavated no bodies. Does it mean that I'm saying that no child died? No, I'm not. Does it mean I'm saying no child was uh, miserable and beaten or had a terrible time and lost his heritage? No, I'm not. I'm saying this, this talk of mass murder or casual criminality is unproven and remains so. And the site that everybody was saying, this is it. This is the one that's going to prove our case. This is going to basically show what horrible monsters our ancestors were 100 years ago. It's all been a fraud. And then politicians like Trudeau, I keep wanting to say Pierre, but it's not Pierre <laughs> Trudeau. Uh, Castro, Trudeau, whatever you want to call him. Uh, Trudeau is basically, they take advantage of it to basically milk the liberal progressive heartstrings and build up white guilt and promote wokeness and all this and that. I mean, how he actually may believe this stuff. So he may not be the complete hypocrite. I think he is. He just may be a fool, but, uh, well, no, it's easy to believe that, you know, as a friend of, and, and a person who grew up, uh, you know, in reservations, in near reservations in Northern Wisconsin, Yes, there is a tragedy that's built in when the settlers came uh, across this country, okay, and displaced people who did not have a nation, displaced people who did not own property, displaced people who, for all intents and purposes, here's what happened, okay? We landed here hundreds and hundreds of years ago from Spain, England, France, uh, name the, the European country they got here. And we ran into people who were, for the most part, friendly. But we noticed, first of all, they, they hadn't invented the wheel. They had no written language. They, uh, you know, we just, we couldn't understand what we were running into. 
uh, and we were in, in that time in conquest. Now they also, the Native Americans here, the indigenous people, were also at a time of conquest. Every tribe had warriors. Every tribe prided itself on the um, uh, young uh, teenage uh, indigenous person who could steal the most horses from the, the neighboring tribe. That's how you, you grew up in rank. I mean, it, and so lo and behold, the Europeans did not know how to deal with what they thought was savages. These people don't know nothing. Uh, they have not progressed at all, and so uh, they were going to conquest over them, and they did. And it was bad. It was tragic. When talking to my Indian friends, the biggest tragedy is not what the white man did. It's that the, bro the government broke its treaty. They don't hate the white people. They are so disappointed that the treaty they set up with the United States government to set up a huge reservation in the Black Hills area was broken because uh, the white man found gold. Gold and then their hills. Gold and then their hills. And uh, this, if you could have kept that treaty, things would have been a lot different. And it, it also turns on this issue that we're seeing in, politically in the United States of reparations where uh, a California commission is basically saying give a million plus dollars to each African-American who lives in California because of the sins of slavery in the past. And when we start thinking in terms of group guilt, we're missing the boat. Sin is individual, it's not collective. We collectively can each individually do sins, but you are judged on your own life and works and merits and faith in Christ. New Testament. You're not judged, New Testament. Yeah, you're not judged by the color of your skin or your gender or your sexual, all that. All your, that. your rebellious age, yeah. your rebellious nation. I mean, because, because, you know, I studied American history in college. I've always had an interest in it. And, you know, one of the things that I've never heard addressed is that at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, there were 3,500 free blacks in the South who among them owned 15,000 slaves. There are black slaveholders in the South, free blacks, who, and the free blacks will, who own slaves are eligible in the California scheme for the same reparations as the people who's, whom they owned. Uh, my ancestors never owned slaves. They were, you know, in the North, and Kevin, your family came after the Civil War was over. Uh, my uh, family, uh, there, there's there's people in my family who the fought. The Norwegian side. In, in, in that. Uh, and in well, other first, words, how can Kevin's Norwegian ancestors who came here in the 19th century be held liable for something that happened several hundred miles to the south with a different people and a different generations and all this and that i think we invite we invaded ireland like six times we owe somebody something well you know that that's different i mean if the irish want to beat up on you kevin that's fine with me um but you know you know in the civil war i can uh, pick out ancestors of mine you know people who survived but they had brothers and friends and cousins who died mm -hmm. fighting the great fight to make men free yeah. Um, the, the reparations for the Civil War were paid by the death of hundreds of thousands of young men. 600,000? In the 18, you know, between 1861 and 1865. But now we've got people from Gavin Newsom to Trudeau to whoever it is pushing these group identity politics and, and racism in ice. Uh, yeah, but I don't think anybody is really pushing reparations seriously who's going to pay for it. Gavin Newsom mentions it. He puts together a team of people who can investigate it. The second they come up with a number, he is as quiet as can be. Nothing. Well, yeah. we see Episcopal churches up north who've got a lot of inherited money mm -hmm. saying, okay, we're going to put aside $5 million, $10 million of our trust funds and endowments to atone for the sins of our ancestors. It's their money. They can do with it what they like. Yeah. But... Should they not be if should they not be spending that money bringing the good news of Jesus? What could that money be used for? That brings the world to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That brings individuals to salvation, rather than line the pockets of race hustlers and the professionally aggrieved. 
Uh, victim culture. Uh, well, no, uh, good but, thing about uh, Central Florida because <laughs> we don't have any inherited money down here in our churches, so no reparations around here. Now, here and here's what George and Kevin are not saying: slavery is okay. Slavery is a horror uh, brought on by man seeking power over man that has existed since day one. Okay, we've seen it all throughout our culture and history, and it was horrible for the, the nation of Africa uh, to be enslaved. It was horrible for uh, the current uh, Islamic slaves in China. It's a horror for um, slavery around the world, which still exists to this day in far greater numbers um, than I, I would like to admit. But it's the modern Christian world that has fought the hardest and the longest to end the yeah. universal condition of slavery. Mm -hmm. I mean, we let people love to beat up on the British Empire, but you know, one of the great things they did was end slavery mm -hmm. in uh, East Africa. And in there was a civilizing, life saving influence. I'm not saying it's perfect, but. Uh, this black and white history that we're seeing from the left, loony left, is just irritating. Yeah, well, it is irritating. Uh, um, Malcolm X complained about the white liberal extensively. He said, don't ever trust him. I said, I, and I agree with that. But in this reality, we're trying to make things right in, from the past. And you can't really do that. The, the best we can do is repent and take a step forward. And reparations, well, a, a great virtue signaling, uh, I don't think will ever happen to any degree unless Yale, who has a billion dollars, wants to offer free education to uh, every victim who comes to the door. Yeah, go for it. George, let's move on to other news. Let's talk about Pakistan. We talked a little bit about them the last couple of weeks uh, for the persecution of Christians, about their great uh, uh, vacuum they have in leadership at the church level and at the uh, uh, secular level, the government level. The update now is we have 25 burnt churches. Yes, uh, the site of the the, uh, the riots were in the eastern, in a suburb of the eastern city of Faisalabad. Um, and as soon as this began, I started getting email messages and Facebook messenger messages from people who watch the show from Pakistan telling me about it and also started getting appeals for financial assistance and and I'm already very leery in responding to appeals for financial assistance for people I don't know because there's scoundrels out there um, but and so I would get these as here are the lists of churches that were burned and I didn't really report it because there's no way I can corroborate it and I don't want to uh, Fred feed false information but enough has now passed where reporters on the ground, government officials, church leaders whom I trust have basically been giving us the, the a scope. 25 formal churches were burned, meaning these were set aside consecrated church buildings of all sorts of denominations, Protestant, Catholic, uh, independent Church of Pakistan, all that, that, plus several dozen house churches. It's not uncommon. Uh, for a little church to meet in somebody's front room. Uh, hunts, uh, at this stage, 100 families have are to be compensated $6,800 each for their houses being torched by the extremists. So that is 100 families or 100 houses, 25 churches, and 160 people 158 Muslim extremists and two Christians who are accused of burning a Quran to starting all this have been arrested. What the police are saying in that city is that because of the political insecurity in Pakistan, because of Imran Khan, the prime minister uh, being forced out of office, and there are going to be elections soon, and there's a everybody's fighting, and the Muslim extremists. The uh, remember, there's a there are political parties who basically are aligned with the Taliban in Pakistan are making a push and trying to radicalize their base. Pakistan's terrible economic issues, young people, severe youth unemployment, and a good riot, just like in Russia in the old days when the Tsar had a problem, 
let's blame the Jews and have a good pogrom and that'll sort of, uh, sort of bolster our support. Well, that's what's happening. We're having the Pakistan version of that. They're having a bad time, so what do we do? Oh, let's attack the Christians. And that'll sort of let off steam and pressure against the politicians or they uh, redivide this increasingly shrinking pie in Pakistan. The plight of Pakistani Christians is bad, and the lack of strong church and political leadership in the country only makes it worse. Only makes it worse. Yeah, that's true. All right. Uh, it started in the 80s, our next story. Uh, I remember, I think it was, uh, I went to Verona High School here, you know, just south of Madison, and hockey practice was on Sunday morning because that's when they could get free rink time. So all the uh, Wisconsin uh, Verona high schoolers who wanted to be in the hockey team had to practice on Saturday morning and Sunday morning and I think Wednesday morning. And my pastor at the time made us think about it. And he said Sunday is you know, kind of the one time in the week that we reserve for worshiping and gathering together as a church. And uh, he put out a great plea in the small Verona newspaper in 1882 or 83, don't remember exactly when. And I made a note of it, okay, church is important. It's reserved for Sunday. Bishop Libby Lane of, she's Derby, isn't she? Derby, I think. Derby, Derby, decides that skipping church is okay for football. George? Now, oh, 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 world soccer world. Yeah, soccer, soccer. I, I meant to say soccer. Football. Go. They call it football, but uh, the Women's World Cup soccer final was held, and it was England versus, was it Sweden? Uh, uh, somebody. Uh, another I, European you country. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it was on a cable channel like ESPN 12, <laughs> uh, you know, after the Cornhole Championships from yeah. Wisconsin. Uh and Libby Lane, the Bishop of Derby, whom we're reliably told is the dumbest member of the House of Bishops of the Church of England, at least intelligent, at least intellectually. Fierce. Alleged, alleged. Alleged, alleged. Yes. We don't know this. She, t- she told the Times of London uh, in an interview that it was okay to skip church or to change your worship habits to fit in time to watch the uh, soccer game and this just caused a uh, how should I put it I haven't found many people defending Libby Lane especially since England lost it was a wasted day anyway (laughs) but Libby Lane you know and and it's been picked up across the spectrum on left and right in England as emblematic of the failure of nerve of the leaders of the Church of England Mm-hmm. Um, she basically said, you know, oh, you can do worship anytime, anywhere, blah, blah, blah. And But this is the once in a lifetime opportunity. She sounded like a promoter of the women's soccer team rather than a leader of the Church of God in the Diocese of Derby. And she, the lack of confidence of the Church of England's leadership where their first act is to try to appease the culture, to appear with it, to appear, oh, well, yeah, this is more important than our worship. This is more important of our collectively gathering and praising the creator of of all things. Um, It's, it just is, it's a minor, small thing, but at the same time, with such a bad press, over the last few years about safeguarding failures, about leadership failures, about the total disconnect between the leadership and the people in the pews, but the bishops all basically being soft left uh, political liberals while the majority of their parishioners are not, to have a bishop who's a bit of a goofball. uh, Allegedly. Alleged goofball, say, Oh, it's okay to skip church to watch the soccer game on TV. I mean, at a certain point, you've got to say, you, I have a great deal of sympathy for like Brett Murphy, who one of the friends of this show who recently left to start a Free Church of England congregation in Morecambe, uh, up in up in uh, I think it's Lancaster area mm-hmm. of England. 
saying like, you know, at a certain point, you just have to say, what's the point? I mean, and when can this, how can this, can you turn around? This is not a sinking ship. It's a sinking barge <laughs> that is just slowly, slowly, slowly settling to the bottom. In 1982, Pastor Paul Sheely of the United Church of Christ said, no, we're not, it's not right. We're not going to do it. And uh, hopefully our church members won't be on that hockey team. Exactly many, many years, 36 years later, should not have the same response come from the Church of England saying, no, uh, we're, we worship God far before, far forward than we do anything else. And football isn't even in the icon of things we worship. And our uh, members will be attending church as normal. We would ask the World Soccer Association, whatever it's called, uh, to please move it because uh, the Church of England is about, uh, and England and the UK is about God, not soccer. What a great chance to put yeah. the right message forward. Yeah, we're not in the world, but oh, you know, we need to be people who are in the world, but not of it. Who we we need not conf we sh must not, not conform. conform. Uh, to this broken, fallen place. We must transform it. Um, the, the point down here in God's country in Florida, we only have had this problem of kids sports on Sunday mornings post COVID because uh, the churches started up at the youth sports was allowed to continue because it was outside. Florida was very liberal on that point, Governor DeSantis, but because church was inside, we shut down. And so the soccer and the football and all the different associations swallowed up that point. So now I'm missing half a dozen, a dozen kids every Sunday who are doing sports, whatever season it is. Um, I'm not changing my schedule. And, you know, I'm quietly encouraging the parents to do you really think young Johnny is going to basically be a professional football player? Or do you think he's going to die one day and needs to know the loving Lord Jesus Christ, which you think is more likely? Mm. Um, I'm not that dumb at putting it in that fashion, <laughs> but the, 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 the church must stand for something or it stands for nothing. If the church does not stand against the culture of this world and shout stop, and point to Jesus Christ. It's just another Elks Lodge. And nothing wrong with the Elks Lodge, but you know, they serve better food there than they do here at the parish on Sunday after coffee hour. Now, I heard from some people over in England that churches didn't do it. They didn't close their doors to go watch the football. Uh, so I, I think it was just a, a bishop finally made press, George. Well, <laughs> If I were in her diocese, I would be so embarrassed. You know, it's be like, oh. not again. What are we uh, going to do? <laughs> if I were in any diocese in the Church of England. Oh, well. So, yeah. All right. Let's move on to some more news here. Um, we talked about Pakistani uh, persecution. Let's move on to Israel persecution. They're still persecuting Christians. Um, and now it's a step up. They're denying visas, work visas. Yeah, Israel's going through a period of political instability. Netanyahu, like Pakistan, yeah, except except yeah. it's not as not as bad <laughs> as Pakistan. Netanyahu, which I always thought was an internet company, but uh, there uh, you go. Uh, dad joke. <laughs> Netanyahu has had to put together a coalition that includes very conservative uh, religious parties, and when they distribute the ministries of government, these guys get power, and then when they get in power, they basically get their way. And one of the things that's being reported by the International Christian Embassy, which is a non-denominational Christian group that has missions in Israel, is that visa, work visas for expatriate clergy are now not being approved and renewed. Uh, whether this is the International Christian Embassy or all, we don't know yet, but that's starting to go to litigation where the Israeli Ministry of the Interior or whoever does visas is basically saying we don't need no we don't need any Christian proselytizing in Israel. Thank you very much. 
Now, whether they would apply that to say, uh, let's say David Pelleggi hired an assistant from the United States, would they give him a work visa? Um, don't know if that hasn't been the point, but we're seeing a administrative crushing of religious uh, freedom in the sense of having uh, pastors freely enter the country. To be fair, we're seeing that uh, in France where they're basically expelling mullahs and imams uh, who are from Algeria and Saudi Arabia and kick them out of the country because they're inciting uh, militant Islam. And the other thing we ha uh, that has come up is both sides, everybody's on a short fuse. Kevin, you've got a cat who everybody is watching at this stage in back of you. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, my. Uh, keep talking. The Feast of the Ascension, the Orthodox Ascension, was just, uh, I think, last week. And it's traditional to have a procession to Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is the traditional place that the Transfiguration took place. And that's up near the Sea of Galilee on the west side. It's in an area now known as the Golan Heights. And there are Arab villages around that. And traditionally, Christians march up and to the top of the mountain have a service on, a, on Transfiguration Sunday. If I said Ascension Day, I meant Transfiguration, excuse me. And this last one, the Israeli police blocked the pilgrims. And they said there was a security concern, you, we can't let you march through the Arab villages up to the top of the mountain. Well, the marchers didn't believe that because every year we march to the villages and the, all little guys come out trying to sell us junk and trinkets and stuff. Lots of trinkets. But the... Uh, Evidently, Hamas and uh, has ratcheted up. We've had a series of terror attacks and murders, and the Israeli police is responding by basically, if there's nobody there to get killed, nobody will get killed. But the Christian Israelis are viewing this as prejudice against them. May well be, may well be a local commander who doesn't like him, or at the same time, somebody who's just saying, I don't want any grief whatsoever, so let's forbid a Transfiguration, a transfiguration Day pilgrimage. So the, the th following on what you and David Plaguey talked about, it's a difficult time in the Middle East, and we just need to pray for the Christians there and in Nigeria and Pakistan and China, which we spoke about at length last week. It's not a good time in the world. Nope. It's, as I'm going to tell you, you probably never heard this word before, dystopian. 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 All right. Let's, uh, um, here's a, some good news. Uh, like I said, sometimes we talk about purely Anglican news. Sometimes we talk about other denominations. There's a friendly denomination towards the ACNA. They're Lutherans, the North American Lutheran Church, and they have reelected Bishop Dan Silva um, to be their leader, George. Dan Selb, a B, not a V, Selbo. Oh, Selbo. I had to write uh, it down. Okay, I did, I did not write it down there. That's why I screwed it up. He was reelected the NALC uh, bishop or primate. Mm -hmm. The NALC uh, is akin in many ways to the ACNA. Uh, in other words, they are those traditionally minded Lutherans who withdrew from the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, the ELCA, the big one, uh, over the ELCA's march to apostasy, uh, getting all wild and woolly and kooky. Um, I had a number of uh, ELCA classmates in seminary. Mm -hmm. uh, this is 30 years ago. Uh, Episcopalians were the largest number at yeah. that time. There weren't any Anglicans at that point. Uh, well, I'm sure there were, but there <laughs> or, weren't any. They were overseas, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so the number two, second largest group were the Lutherans. And the Episcopalians, because we had a prayer book, we really had more of a, we had more, we were required to take more Bible courses than the Lutherans, uh, just to get through the Episcopal process. And the Lutheran Church got crazier sooner, I think, because it lost its uh, biblical moorings. And I mean, I know some, I know one girl who was a Lutheran pastor, who was a classmate with, who managed not to take any Bible courses whatsoever to get a Master's of a Divinity degree. Yeah. I, and I, um, I can back this up. I talked to a bishop in the church 
he was visiting uh, in the North American Lutheran Church. He was visiting Trinity Seminary when I was uh, there doing a, some recording 10 years ago. And we got to talking. He said, I can't find any good seminarians. And he listed five or six of the big seminaries to uh, take students from and make them clergy because all they know is climate change. All they know is woke. All the, you know, he, he listed all the stuff they know. And he says, I don't even think they own Bibles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. And, you know, Kirk Stevenson is the retired Bishop of Arizona. He's an Episcopal. He's very liberal. Yeah. He's a very pleasant guy, nice guy. I've met him a few times. He wrote an article in the Living Church a month or so ago saying the Episcopal seminary system right now is so bad because they're they're putting all this time and energy into the electives and the 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 daily work of the priest of learning how to preach knowing your bible learning how to do pastoral care learning to do the sacraments is all being sacrificed sacrificed to what you were saying climate change or gender equality or whatever the latest greatest trend and fad that the professors want to teach there's the the rigor uh is gone yeah, from a lot is. of clergy training. And we have liberal Episcopalian bishops complaining about that now. You get people coming out with an expensive degree who have no idea what, you know, it, seminary should be a trade school. And it's like we're graduating plumbers who don't know how to snake a drain. Uh, I remember being on a vestry many years ago in the early 90s, 1995-ish, and we were doing a search for a priest. And I don't know if I was senior warden at the time or junior warden, but it became very clear to me that the biggest lack of seminaries back then was teaching priest, clergy, MDivs any administration skills. Mm-hmm. I, they had the Bible down, they had all that stuff, down, but they could they could not administrate themselves out of an office at all. And I I, I hope that's changed. But I think they, they, they've turned it all to woke electives, George. I think you're right. Well, I think we should congratulate the NALC. Sure. Uh, they've, they've plumped for continuity. Uh, they have a track, I think, at Trinity Seminary in Ambridge for yes. NALC students. Yes. So I think that's one of their approved seminaries. So we wish them well, and uh, God bless them in their continued life and witness. Well, they're more they're they're basically more prominent in areas where Anglicans are traditionally thin on the ground, like in the upper Midwest, where they're Lutheran heavy. Uh, well, it, Lutheran heavy, but the, the Lutheran heavy here in the Midwest because Missouri Synod was a very strong synod within the Lutheran Church, and um, it quickly developed a bad reputation in the mid '80s for just being uh, what's uh, bullying. No, I'm just looking cranky. for. A, cranky <laughs> old style and uh you know it, it's still around today but it, it's changed you know the reality on the ground we, we here there there's no methodism anymore methodists are gone they imploded exploded um there was just no way forward after they had their their great meeting a couple years ago uh to see the amount of churches that have left the methodists is astonishing and good yeah, the Methodists changed their ways. They adopted woke. They adopted uh, critical race theory. They adopted transgenderism and identity politics. And for all the right reasons, they broke apart. Okay, that, that was you know that's a good sign. It's one of my great hopes that in in my lifetime we'll see a coming together of the the call the World Methodist Church and the mm-hmm. NALC and the ACNA and the faithful remnants of the Episcopal Church into a liturgical Protestant church. Okay, there I've alienated a half. You did. Order. What are you doing? <laughs> well, hey, into hey. one, in, into a single body that proclaims Christ to the world. Yeah. Um, uh, instead uh, of our, tr- instead of trying to find ways to climb in bed with the Catholics or. Uh, P is the Orthodox with uh, dropping the filio clause and all that. Let's work with the people who we live next door to, who we share common uh, views and dreams. We just go to different tailors, and Episcopal wives are better looking anyway. So, uh. <laughs> Well, but that's the reality. Is, uh, the vast majority of Christians, uh, Orthodox Christians, uh, Evangelical Christians, want to see 
uh, a reunification of the church. Um, some, many of us don't know what that will look like, which is fine. People like me want to see the reunification of the entire church with the repentance of the Episcopal Church joining us, with the repentance of the Methodist Church, with the repentance and, and turning around of the old Lutheran Church, that we may all as one become one again under Christ through repentance. That's that's my hope. Uh, yeah, is is that a far cry from ever happening? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty far cry from ever happening, but that has to be our hope in Christ, that we do all become one in Christ. We, we're not all to become one in John 17. We're all to become one in Christ. Uh, there's a response now to what's happening in Niger, and I thought we could talk about that. Yeah, uh, in Niger, there was the coup, and we talked about it in the past few weeks, about the coup leaders essentially echoing in political terms the same words that we're hearing from church leaders in Africa of, you cannot be our boss, you cannot tell us what to do, you cannot basically treat us as little children anymore. Um, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, uh, under the prodding of France, has threatened military intervention to restore the elected government in Niger. Uh, the churches, church leaders are now responding. Uh, Daniel uh, Sarfo, the former primate of West Africa, Bishop of Kumasi in Ghana, has said, no, 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 the last thing in the world we need is another war. Um, let, and the let, and we, definitely don't want French troops on the ground fighting in Africa uh, and f and to put one group of people over another. We have the Catholic bishops of Nigeria saying no to war and no to the Nigerians sending their army north to uh, restore uh, the president. We've had Emmanuel Chukwuma, who is the, is the flamboyant bishop, archbishop of uh, the, the province down in the Niger Delta, basically saying the same thing as Daniel Sarfo, which is war is not going to be the answer, that if if we, war will only create chaos and will not restore the status quo. And they point to what's been happening in the Ukraine. Um, and one of the, one of the, I forget which one I said, you know, we don't want to be like the Ukrainians where the Americans keep sending us weapons that we use to kill our, each other and no American dies, but tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Africans die in a war that really doesn't need to be fought. So uh, we're seeing the church speak out to no on war on theological principles, no on war on political principles, and also, no, we don't want the West to tell us how to solve this problem. And so France, thank you very much, but no, we don't want the Foreign Legion marching up and uh, putting somebody in new in power in uh, uh, what's the capital there, Najami, I think it is. All right, I thought of one more topic I want to talk about. What's that? What's that? Okay, recently I was talking to a friend. How, how do I make sure you nobody can identify this person, whom I know, who is a uh, probably a fifteen-year uh, veteran school teacher in Connecticut. Uh, she is a she, she is a science teacher, and she teaches in a moderate uh, school system in Connecticut. She's she, not in New Haven then? No, not in New Haven. <laughs> uh, Prominently wealthy. In conversations with her, she says that in the recent parent-teacher conferences uh, last spring, she did not meet one parent who showed up for a teacher conference that did not have at least one transgendered child in their family. Identity politics is running rampant in our public schools. Um, and what they've done is they just redefine what terms are. And they've been teaching this gender spectrum and stuff like that. She goes, I, I can't believe this happened in 10 years. When she started, there's no transgender uh, students. Now all will either identify as non-binary um, uh, or w somewhere in that spectrum, and nobody is willing to identify as male or female. 
because they're they're put down upon. You know, male or female is uh, bullied. But if you're part of the rainbow, you're not bullied. And she says, I can't believe this happened in 10 years. And this is what's going to come up and be voting in, in five or 10 years. These middle schoolers become high schoolers, become college students. And you know, how do we persuade, persuade them not to be voters until they figure out who you You can't become a voter if you don't know <laughs> what your biological sex is. And oh, this is actually a. I agree with Vivek Ramaswamy, the young man, oh, yeah, yeah. 20 years younger than I am, running yeah. for president. That's sure. really annoying, Kevin, I must say. I vote for uh, him. <laughs> uh, saying that uh, we should have, uh, you should have a basic, just as you have a driver's license mm -hmm. test, you should have a civics test before you can register to yeah. vote. Because the degree of ignorance about how our government and systems work is so extraordinary. We've got, as you say, a whole generation of rising that is abysmally ignorant. Yeah. Um, well, I blame the parents. <laughs> uh. Well, in a way, yeah, the, the parents are to blame because they're not taking uh, a vested interest in what their kids are being taught. Okay. My biggest regret as a parent, uh, I, I parented three children. Uh, Victoria, my oldest, is turning 30 September 29th. I've been doing this a long time, and I didn't do it perfectly. But my biggest regret as a parent was not teaching my daughters how to be uh, mothers and teaching my son how to be a father. I taught them how to be smart, educate, Christian. Um, I taught uh, how to advance in their careers, how to treat other people with decency and stuff like that. But in the end, we forgot how to. I forgot how to teach my children, and my wife forgot how to teach our children how to be mothers and fathers. And you know what they aren't right now? None of my kids have children. They they just yeah we we're not we're not into that you know. And I think, you know, the the people like myself who came out of the mid '80s uh, and knew the value of a good career, the value of a good education the value of uh, treating people correctly, uh, being young, <laughs> the term was yuppies at the time, uh, we forgot to teach our kids how to be uh, mothers and fathers. And, the, you know, this, this is going to hurt. It's not just America. Everybody's yeah. facing a demographic, demographic crash. Sure. China, Europe, uh, Iran has one of the worst demographic crises. Um, there's something in the world. Maybe people don't want to bring children into a world this uncertain or this difficult. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but demography is destiny. And that's why I'm confident that uh, my little church will be here in 50 years' time, where what happens up north in the Episcopal Church won't matter because they'll all be dead and turned into discotheques or bowling alleys or whatever. Yes, yeah, somebody did the math. They only have so many years left in the Episcopal Church. So, well, parts of the Episcopal Church. Parts of the Episcopal Church. I got 12 that. years till my pension is all set, so Kevin, we <laughs> give me 12 years. <laughs> I saw the numbers. Your pension's safe. <laughs> Indeed. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 818 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>